looking at the uh, Sermon on the Mount, beginning with the Beatitudes. And today we're carrying on beyond the Beatitudes. And it never fails. As I hear the word red, about 15 ideas come to mind about other things I would like to say and get into. About how I'd like to go deeper into the word. And boy, I tell you this morning, there's no exception. Today, though, I'm going to have to use a bad word in church. I'm a little nervous about having to use this word, as some of you might be highly offended, and for that I affront, apologize. But this is a word that we need to talk about. It's a word that's before us today in the scriptures. That word is change. Change. I'm sorry. I said it. Look where you're sitting right now. Yeah, you should know where this is going. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> this is where you normally sit, right? Yeah. Have you ever found somebody else sitting in your queue in your place? <laughs> what do you do when that happens? You sit someplace else. <laughs> This is a common malady in churches all across the United States. It's common that people find a place where they're comfortable, they sit near people they're used to sitting next to, they talk and they converse and they're comfortable. There's a church down south that really suffered from this issue. Mrs. Rupert, the widow of one of the most powerful men in town, the woman of a church that held just about every position in the church, had her spot. Two rows from the front on the left-hand side. Now, I want you to know, I know that's normally where you sit when you come in. This has nothing to do with you. Mrs. Rupert and you share nothing in common, so. <laughs> so prepare to be offended, right? Well, no, actually, I want you to know this is not directed. She had her spot. If somebody was sitting in her spot, she's one of those people that would sit there, browbeating them until they were uncomfortable enough and they moved. <laughs> It was known you didn't take Mrs. Rupert's spot. Unfortunately for her, she developed cancer. And it wasn't that the folks wanted her to pass. She was loved. She had other redeeming qualities, of course. But they all knew that she had a will that included a very large sum of money to the church. How did everybody know what she was giving, you ask? Well, she was very willing to let people know. <laughs> She let people know what she was going to be given. One day, as she's uh, preparing, she went and had a meeting with the pastor and told the pastor that she is changing her will a little bit, that she's placing a condition upon her uh, bequest to the church. And that is that the pastor had to put a bronze statue of her <laughs> in that pew. <laughs> So that every day she's still there, and that no one else would ever have her pew, it was hers. <laughs> Nowadays, you can go into this beautifully remodeled church where everything has been redone, and it's nice, and you can sit wherever you want except for second aisle to the left, aisle seat. This is Rupert's sit there. <laughs> Change is always hard. We can laugh at it a little bit, but change is hard. It's not easy for us to deal with. And I know I talk about change quite a bit, but what happens when what you and I have been doing has been proven to be wrong? We're identified uh, that what we did isn't right, that the way we've always done it isn't the way we should have always done it. What are we willing to do? These are the issues that Jesus is addressing. This is where Jesus is going. And it's going to be what we're going to talk about today. Let us, though, start with prayer. Gracious Lord, as we open your word today, we struggle to always understand what it is that you're trying to tell us. And we pray, God, that through your spirit, you would illuminate our hearts and our minds to fully, to more, to better comprehend your word today. That in understanding your word, we would draw closer to you, walk closer with you, love you a little bit more, and to be more obedient. 
I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ and through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. The passage starts off with salt and light. These are important passages. There's a lot to be gained out of it. And I love talking about salt. We like salt, right? We use salt today for what? <laughs> Flavoring, right? How many in your kitchen have more than one kind of salt? Raise your hand. <laughs> Pink Himalayan, iodine, sea salt, kosher salt, you know the whole. Salt's important. It used to be important because that's how we preserve food. We're called to be salt. We're called to be preservatives. We're called to be uh, spice for the world, to give it flavor, to preserve and keep it clean. What happens if you get too much salt in one place? It kills what's, whatever that's on, right? You know, the Romans used to spread salt across the fields of the places where they conquered and they would kill and you could grow things in that field. Too much salt in one location. There's, there's applications that we can talk about there. Light, being light to the world is important. And what does that mean to be light to the darkness and dispelling the darkness? And there's so much we can say about that, but those are two areas that we're not going today. Today we're going to look at the second half of this passage and spend more time with that. It's a little bit more difficult for us. Jesus is saying some things in that passage, that part of the passage, that kind of shapes, reshapes how we might think of Jesus. So what does it mean when Jesus says, I come to fulfill the law? What does it mean to fulfill the law? What's that? Following God's word. Following God's word. We understand the law as the old covenant. God gave the law to, to Jeremiah, right? And, thank you. God, I just want to see if somebody was awake. God gave the law to Moses. And Moses came down off that mountain the first time and he gave the law to the people and they readily accepted it, right? <laughs> what happened the first time he came down the mountain? He got so upset about what he saw, he smashed the tablets. Had to go back up and get two new tablets. This was God's covenant with his people, that if they kept that covenant, he would be their God and they would be his people. We see Jesus as the new covenant the new relationship we have with God. Jesus came that we might have life fully, both now and forevermore, through him. So we have the old covenant and we have the new covenant. And with this understanding, we kind of get this position that, uh, that, that we have a new covenant which supplants the old covenant, that does away with the old covenant. Right? Jesus, by the way, when he was talking to the people on the Sermon on the Mount, he wasn't, they didn't know him as the new covenant yet, so they didn't have this argument. This really applies to us today as we're hearing Jesus' words. They're important for us today for a little bit of a different reason, but it's still vitally important for us to understand that Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He didn't come to abolish and do away with what was and to make something new. He came to fulfill it. To make it whole. So this brings us to what we need to know. We struggle with how to understand the Bible. The authoritative word of God. The Old and New Testament. Everything there contained, uh, contained therein. In ordination, one of the questions we ask people is, do you accept the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament to be by the Holy Spirit, the, authority, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal and to God's, and God's word to you. We ask, do you understand this to be authoritative, to be unique, to be God's word for you? We understand that there is a lot in here that we're to follow and that we're to do. That, that question, by the way, is a deeply theological question that places a strong importance on the Bible, upon the scriptures. Yet how do we understand the Bible to be authoritative? Is everything in here authoritative? Are we to follow every word? Is it all so important to us even today? Are the rules of the Old Testament just as important to us today as they were to the people back then? How many of you have ever read all of Leviticus and Deuteronomy? 
You? Yeah. How many rules are contained there? A lot, right? A lot of very weird rules, too. A lot of rules that are a little bit of obscure and hard for us to follow. Are they all important? Should we? Can we begin to even follow all of them? We could get into a discussion about the rules that we just simply don't follow today. Let me ask you, how many of you today are wearing here at church clothes made of two different kinds of fabric? How, let me put it a different way. How many here today find it really important that you wear clothes of only one fabric? Raise your hand. How many of you have stoned your child for being disobedient? No. No, no, no. no. I mean, not how many wanted to. How many have actually stoned your child for being disobedient? Brandon, I know you haven't been stoned like that yet. Does throwing pebbles out count? How many here have sold their daughters into slavery for being disobedient? By the way, young ladies, when you have to clean the house, that's not slavery. Get over it. <laughs> How many of you like hamburgers? How many like cheese on their hamburgers? The Bible says you're not supposed to eat meat cooked in its mother's milk. You can't mix meat and dairy products. How many like bacon? <laughs> totally unkosher. <laughs> So many of these rules in the Old Testament we really don't pay attention to today. How do we understand the authoritative word of God and still have rules that we don't listen to? We can discuss the multitude of reasons we do these things today. But that still doesn't really answer why we fail to understand what we fail to understand about the Bible. Today's passage really doesn't help us to understand that either. We don't understand the how and the why we fail to follow what the Bible has us do. What today's passage does do for us is it tells us that we are wrong about how we understand Jesus and what Jesus came to do and how he came to make the scriptures whole and complete. To better understand what Jesus came to do, to better understand what the Bible and the law, what they're for, we should turn our attention to Matthew 22, verses 33 through 40, where a, where a young attorney came to Jesus and asked him, what is the most important of all the commandments? When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked the question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And he said to him, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love the neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Which of the commandments is that? Can somebody name the number that that is? One. one. No. Four. No. One. You're only part way right. You should love your neighbor as yourself. Which of the commandments is that? It's a summary. The first four commandments shall have no other gods before me. Do not create idols, and I'm not getting these in the right order. I think that's number four. Uh, do not take the Lord's name in vain, and keep the Sabbath holy. Those first four are loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's how we love God. The next six, honor your father and mother. By the way, why do we honor our father and mother? Huh? Tradition. Tradition, that's a good answer, but not quite right. Yes? They gave us life. They gave us life. We are to honor our mother and father so that we might live a long and full life. Honestly, what's in there? It's the only, read, it's the only commandment, by the way, that gives a reason why we're to have that, you know, follow that commandment. It's pretty funny. God, the parents can give us life, but they can take it away from us too, right? In the Old Testament, apparently he gave him permission. He can stone them or sell them. I digress. So, honor your father and mother, but not bear false witness. Do not covet. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. And do not steal. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus has summed up the last six in the second part of that. One of the greatest commandments. His answer, which is the greatest. Jesus took all ten commandments, summed them up, 
and gave it to us. But then he goes one step further, and this is crucial. This is the linchpin that holds the explanation of why those two are important. And he says, upon these two hang all the law and the prophets. What Jesus is talking about is all the law that's contained in the scriptures. And all that the prophets came and said and did. God's reason for giving us law is so that we might love God fully and that we might love each other fully. God's, the reason the prophets came, the reason that God sent the prophets to us was to give us the message that says, love me and love each other better. You're not doing a good job. We get hung up on the rules. We get hung up on what we're supposed to do or not supposed to do. And we lose the importance of what they are there for in the first place. Jesus is calling us to be more. To be more than followers of rules. To rise above that. The Jewish community is not the only set of people that get hung up on rules. <laughs> this is one of the major pitfalls in all of religion. Our faith lays out rules. Their faith lays out rules. And we can often identify people of faith by how they live their lives. How they cut their hair or let it grow. How they work and live. Whether it's in a cloister community that has no electricity or electrical engines. We can identify people by the way they live out the rules that are important to them. Now, rules are important, but we often get lost in the rules, all while forgetting why the rules were there in the first place. Now, sometimes rules can be funny. Sometimes they are out of place and out of date. There's an urban legend about rules that, uh, that I was looking up, and I've heard some of these. I was surprised about some more about archaic rules that we've still have on the books in America. Do you know that it's illegal to tickle women in Virginia? <laughs> Don't ask me why. Do you know that in Kentucky it is illegal for a woman to buy a hat without her husband's permission? <laughs> you want to go back to Kentucky? You think Sarah will go with you? <laughs> In South Carolina, it is legal for you to beat your wife on the courthouse steps on Sunday. I heard another version of that says that you're allowed to use a stick but can only be as big as your thumb. Woe to that woman with big, that's married to a man with big hands. In Indiana, it's illegal for monkeys to smoke cigarettes. <laughs> That's an important rule, I think. I think that's what we can all agree that that shouldn't happen. We're talking about rules, though, found in scriptures. Those rules that we generally like to say that the rules we find in scriptures are important, but we often forget why they are there in the first place. When Jesus was asked which of those commandments were most important, he gave the answer that no one was expecting. They weren't looking for that. They were hoping he would say one of the commandments and that they would then trip him up. I guarantee you that attorney had a trap for every one of the Ten Commandments of why it shouldn't be the most important and why it should be the most important. Attorneys are good at that. He gave an answer that no one was expecting. He gave an answer that we sometimes still miss today. He gave the answer for the Ten Commandments and the purpose, the purpose for the law, the purpose for the prophets. Jesus came to fulfill the law. Fulfill the law and its original and divine purpose. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. The purpose of the law was again that our relationship with God would be made right, and that our relationship with each other would be right, and Jesus came to fulfill that law, not to abolish it. How we live that law out does change. The purpose remains the same. And Jesus calls us to be more than. Today he calls us to be more than. More than followers of rules. More than just people of the letter of the law. We are to become aware of the spirit of the law. Why it's there in the first place. To be aware why these laws were written. To be aware of what they call us 
and invite us to be. Jesus says, come, be more than. Rules are important. Follow the rules, but understand what they are for, what their purpose is, and what they really call you to do. So that we're not legalistic, but loving. So that we might be changed and find a better way to be. We might be more than. May God give us the ability this week to be more than. To live into that just a little bit more. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, it's always nice when your word gives us easy rules to follow. There's a formula. We can do this, this, and this, and we're good for the day. But unfortunately, we find that that's never true. Unfortunately, you call us to something far greater, far more difficult, far larger than we were hoping for. This week, help, help us to continue to remember what it means to be following you, the fulfiller of the law, so that we might truly be better salt and better light in our world today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing our final hymn, would you stand as we sing? Our hymn is number 467. Our great thou art.